Uh, in May 1964, Adlai Stevenson uh, defended U.S. policy at the, uh, in Vietnam at the United Nations, uh, uh, U.S. military operations, and here's the way he put it. He said, the past, the point is the same in Vietnam today as it was in Greece in 1947. In both cases, the U.S. was defending a free people against what he called internal aggression. In Greece, uh, Stevenson went on to explain, in 1947, after the aggressors had gained, uh, had gained control of most of the country, many people felt that the cause of the government of Greece was hopelessly lost. But as long as the people of Greece were prepared to fight for the life of their own country, the United States was not prepared to stand by while Greece was overrun. That is, overrun by the internal aggressors, uh, the Greeks who were we were defending Greece again. And then Stevenson went on to explain, he said, the United States cannot stand by today while Southeast Asia is overrun by armed aggressors. The armed aggressors at that time being the South Vietnamese and we being the people who were defending South Vietnam against them, against their internal aggression. Well, this, this concept of internal aggression has shown up over and over again in uh, American history. For take it turning to the present, uh, Roger Fontaine, who's one of President Reagan's advisors on Central America, uh, in uh, 1981, he explained that U.S. policy in Central America should be modeled on what the United States did in Greece in 1947 with the Truman Doctrine. Uh, these uh, analogies, and there are others, are very apt on the part of administration figures, Stevenson, Fontaine, Reagan, and others. Uh, the fact is that in El Salvador, as in Vietnam and in Greece and many other places, uh, we are, in fact, uh, defending the country, defending the country against uh, internal aggression. Now, this interesting concept has very deep roots in American history. It goes way back before this period. Uh, it goes back to the days when we were defending ourselves against the internal aggression of the Native American population, who we incidentally wiped out in the process. In the post-World War II period, we've frequently had to carry out defense against internal aggression, that is, against Salvadorans in El Salvador, Greeks in Greece, uh, against the Filipinos in the Philippines, uh, against the South Vietnamese in South Vietnam, and many other places. And the concept of internal aggression has been repeatedly invoked in this connection, and quite appropriately. It's an interesting concept. It's one that George Orwell would certainly have admired, and it's elaborated in many ways in the internal documentary record, uh, secret record, you know, later publicized. So, for example, in 1955, the Joint Chiefs of Staff described the three, uh, they described what they call three forms of aggression that might occur in Southeast Asia. Uh, the first was overt armed attack from outside the area, meaning an attack by China. Uh, the second was overt armed attack from within the area of each sovereign state. That's, of course, internal aggression, overt attack within the area. And the third was aggression other than arms, that is, political warfare or subversion. Now, that's another interesting one. And defining political warfare as a kind of aggression, the Joint Chiefs revealed with considerable insight that they understood the fundamental principles of American statecraft. Now, this concept of internal aggression also figures quite prominently in American scholarship, uh, so for liberal scholarship in particular, uh, and, and the idea, I may just reinforce what Alan said, the idea that liberal intellectuals of the liberal media were critics of the war is very, very far from the truth. Uh, in fact, they're the typical party liners uh, on most issues, the Indochina war in particular. Uh, here's a case from uh, an interesting example from Arthur Schlesinger, who's the historian, official historian of the Kennedy administration, and in fact is regarded as some kind of anti-war leader. Uh, his, uh, in 19, his, he wrote, uh, you, you call his book Thousand Days, which is the history of the Kennedy administration, and in it he says the following, he says, referring to 1962, he says, 1962 was not a bad year. Uh, the reason, aggression was checked in Vietnam. Uh, well, what aggression was going on in Vietnam in 1962? There was, of course, the internal aggression of the South Vietnamese, and that's what was checked. Uh, but 1962 is an interesting 
example for him to have used because, in fact, 1962 is the year when the United States began the direct attack against South Vietnam. Up until then, we had been supporting a terrorist client regime, which had by then massacred about 80 or 90,000 people while we blocked any political settlement, a regime that we'd installed to allow to do this. But in 1961, in fact, it was getting, things were getting out of hand, so the United States attacked South Vietnam directly. In 1962, the U.S. Air Force began direct bombing, American planes, that is, with American pilots, began the direct bombing of South Vietnam, bombing and large-scale defoliation. This was part of a, uh, an effort to drive several million people into concentration camps where they would be surrounded by armed guards and barbed wire and protected, as we put it, from the uh, guerrillas, the so-called Viet Cong, who we admitted they were, they were willingly supporting. Well, that was 1962, and it's interesting that in liberal history, 1962, the year of the direct American attack against South Vietnam, that's the year in which aggression was checked in Vietnam. Well, again, Orwell would have been impressed. Uh, let's go back to the Greek model, which is a very illuminating and appropriate one. It's interesting that uh, administration apologists and spokespeople keep uh, referring to it. Who were the internal aggressors in Greece in, uh, in uh, 1947 that we had to defend ourselves against? Well, obviously Greeks. Uh, but which Greeks? Well, they were the uh, communist-led, peasant and worker-based uh, movement, which in fact had been the anti-Nazi resistance. Uh, what we, we set in 1947 to destroying the anti-Nazi resistance, the uh, resistance forces, which in fact had held down several hundred thousand German troops, had liberated much of Greece, uh, in fact had liberated Greece before the British uh, entered, had saved Allied airmen, had saved many Jews, and we had to wipe them out and put them in and put in place our own favorites, uh, King Paul and Queen Frederica, who came out of the fascist youth movement, or uh, Minister of Interior, Interior Mavra Mikalas, who was identified by U.S. intelligence as a Nazi agent, uh, and others like them. Uh, and in fact, I should add that this was part of a much more general project that the United States was then engaged in throughout the world. Uh, one of the unpleasant little stories of post-war history, which is not often told is that throughout the world, from North Africa all the way around to South Korea, the United States was engaged in exactly the same project, namely destroying and eliminating the anti-fascist resistance and putting into power uh, fascist and Nazi collaborators. The current fuss about the war criminals that the United States brought in, Nazi war criminals to the United States and many more to Latin America was just one tiny aspect of that much more significant aspects were of the kind that went on in Greece. Well, in Greece, we had to carry out this, uh, uh, this action. We had to fight against the uh, internal aggression of the, uh, the, the reason why we were so chummy with the Nazi war criminals is that they were specialists in exactly what we had to do. That is, their specialty was destroying the resistance, and that's what we were going to do too, so it made perfect, perfectly good sense to pick up people like Klaus Barbie and others and enlist them in the cause which we did. Uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, attack was uh, a, a very serious one. The U.S. mission uh, was uh, uh, set about it, it, it. They were concerned by a number of things. One, one thing that they were concerned with was what the U.S. ambassador in Greece called uh, the, uh, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he referred, he said that there were subversive social forces there who were exhibiting uh, the new growth of class consciousness and totalitarianism, which the American mission pointed out was an alien and subversive influence to which no leniency should be shown until the state has successfully reasserted its dominance. Uh, so the idea is that it was the American mission and its fascist clients who were the native element in Greece and the alien element in Greece, that we, the, the internal aggressors, were the... Uh, were the uh, Greek peasant and workers who had in fact constituted the anti-Nazi resistance. Now, it's not that the United States is against class consciousness. Uh, it's in favor of class consciousness for the better <laughs> class of people. Uh, but of course, not the kind of class consciousness that reflects itself in proletarianism, nothing like that. Uh, that kind of taint is not appropriate. Uh, in fact, the United States and its mission uh, exhibited a high degree of class consciousness in the dedicated savagery which, with which they set out to liquidate the class enemy uh, in Greece. And it was a major affair. Uh, 
Uh, tens of thousands of people were permanently exiled. Tens of thousands more were sent to prison islands where they were tortured or executed, or if they were lucky, only re-educated. We liked re-education camps in those days. Uh, the United States interfered blatantly in the political process. Uh, it eliminated or suppressed even moderate socialist anti-communists. It destroyed the labor unions. Uh, the, uh, uh, it, the, the effect was, was, was uh, quite ser uh, very long-lasting. Gre Greece is, in fact, still not recovered from it. In the early 1960s, about a third of the Greek labor force uh, left, uh, emigrated, uh, simply in order to survive. This was in the course of what we were calling then an economic miracle, namely the buying up of Greece by American corporations. <laughs> All of this was done with the direct participation and enthusiasm of the U.S. mission. And in fact, the, the savagery of this attack on the class enemy uh, even appalled the British, uh, who are not known for their gentlemanly decorum in these matters. But this was too much even for them. Well, that was Greece. That was that model. Uh, and uh, it was duplicated in much of the world, as I, I mentioned. Uh, and it is, in fact, an appropriate model for, for, for things that have happened since. It's a model in another respect as well. Uh, the United States learned an important lesson in Greece, uh, namely to fight the internal aggression of the uh, Greek res anti-Nazi resistance. Uh, the American leadership, Dean Acheson and Truman and others, appealed to the idea that the Russians are coming. And since the Russians are coming, we have to get together and defend ourselves against the, uh, uh, the internal aggression of the Greek resistance. Well, of course, there were, in fact, the Russians were involved there. They were trying to call off the Greek resistance because they recognized that this area was American turf. The reason is it was regarded as part of the periphery of the Middle East. In fact, Greece was not regarded as a European country in the uh, U.S. State Department until the mid-1970s. It was in the Near East section. And part of the motivation for, uh, apart from the necessity to destroy these subversive social forces, uh, there was also the concern within the framework of the domino theory that was formulated for the first time with respect to Greece that the rot might spread. We really should call it the rotten apple theory in its, in its uh, early version, Dean Acheson's. One rotten apple in a barrel might cause the whole barrel to turn rotten. That meant that if there was an independent movement in Greece, an independent nationalist movement infected by these alien social influences, and if it happened to be successful, the rot might spread, that is the rot of successful social and economic development outside of American control, and that could be really dangerous. In fact, it could spread to the oil producing regions in the Middle East and elsewhere in Southern Europe. Uh, and in fact, one of the early CIA reports warned that if we didn't manage to suppress these alien influences in Greece, we might lose our control over Middle East oil. Well, the Russians, as I said, the, Ru the main Russian role there, in fact, the only Russian role, was to try to call off the Greek guerrillas. Uh, but that didn't matter. It turned out to be effective. We were defending ourselves against the Russians, and therefore we could massacre plenty of Greeks. And that model has been uh, also applied over and over again in subsequent years. Well, uh, that's the uh, few remarks about the concept of internal aggression. Now let's take a look at how it works itself out in more detail. Uh, I want to discuss three things here, basically. One, and that's the primary one, is a certain geopolitical conception, a fixed invariant geopolitical conception that was laid out very clearly by American planners who are highly class conscious, that we have the most class conscious ruling class probably of any in the world. Uh, and they, uh, during the 1940s, a very explicit and careful geopolitical conception was crafted and it has since been applied over and over again. Uh, and you won't understand anything about modern history unless you understand it, but if you do understand it, and it's easy to document and see it working out, then I think you'll be able to predict pretty well or understand pretty well the things, most good number of the things that are going on in the world. So I want to talk about that invariant geopolitical conception, which is very deeply rooted in American domestic institutions. And then I want to talk about the way in which it played itself out in the particular cases of Indochina uh, and currently in Central America. There are many other examples that could be uh, used. And in fact, uh, the point, basic point I want to make is that almost anything the United States is engaged in in international affairs uh, and also in the development of the strategic weapon system and so on is simply one or another reflection of this fundamental invariant conception. So you can pick your example and it'll work itself out, I believe. 
So let's start with the geopolitical conception and then turn briefly to Indochina, and then a couple of remarks about Central America, and I apologize to those of you who would like to have some other example selected. Maybe we can talk about them later, but I think, I, th I believe you will find if you look into it that, uh, that, the, exam that, the, uh, that, that the system is essentially pervasive. It applies itself virtually everywhere. The United States is a global power, and it essentially applies the same thinking and the same plans, uh, adapted the local conditions uh, in every part of the world, including domestically, because the American population is a, another kind of victim of these policies. Well, uh, let's begin with the Second World War. During the Second World War, uh, the United States, American planners were well aware that the United States was going to emerge from the war in a position of very significant global dominance, global hegemony. In fact, uh, probably a position of global dominance that had no analog in history. Uh, and it did, in fact. Uh, during the Second World War, from the, the reason is obvious, uh, the United States entered the war as, as the world's major industrial power by a large measure. In fact, it was already the world's greatest industrial power by the turn of the century. Uh, during the war, the uh, rivals of the United States were either destroyed or, or severely damaged, while the United States benefited enormously from the war. In fact, American industrial production probably tripled or quadrupled during the war. So was, and of course, the United States was immune from attack. Other people were getting attacked. Uh, and uh, that meant that we would obviously be a dominant power at the end. This was understood. Uh, from 1939 to 1945, there were extensive planning sessions. I think the most important ones that I know of were conducted by the Council on Foreign Relations, which is the major business input into uh, foreign affairs planning, and involved every top planner in the State Department, uh, with the sole exception of the Secretary of State, who's too busy making speeches. But the real planners were all involved. Uh, and uh, th this was called the War Peace Studies Group. It went on for six years. And it laid down quite explicit plans for the post-war world. The centerpiece of their planning was what they called grand area planning. There was going to be a grand area. And that was going to be an area that, in their terms, was strategically necessary for world control. That it was to be a region that would be subordinated to the needs of the American economy and would ensure world control for the United States. And they did a geopolitical analysis to determine what the grand area must include. And it had to include, as a minimum, the Far East, uh, the Western Hemisphere, uh, and the former British Empire, which we were then in the process of dismantling and taking over for ourselves, using Britain's wartime travail to take over their positions of control and influence. This is incidentally called anti-imperialism in American historical <laughs> writing. Uh, and of course, it had to include Western Europe and the oil-producing regions of the Middle East. That was the minimum of the grand area. And the maximum would just be everything. Uh, <laughs> somewhere in between that would be the grand area. And detailed plans were laid for uh, what would, for how the grand area should be run, and how we should, how it should, in fact, be subordinated to the needs of the American economy. Uh, let's take two, the two areas I want to talk about: the Far East and Latin America. With respect to the Far East it was understood that Japan was going to be, sooner or later, the industrial heartland uh, of the region, the workshop of Asia. And Japan, being a resource-poor region, uh, needed access to resources and markets, and that should be South and Southeast Asia. Uh, of course, all of this incorporated within the US-dominated global system. Japan had tried to do something of that, like that on its own. And in fact, that was the primary basis for excluding the United States, and that was essentially what lay behind the Pacific War. Well, now we were going to let Japan do it, but within the framework of American control. That's Asia. Uh, with respect to Latin America, plans were less explicit because uh, Latin America was essentially taken for granted. Uh, uh, Henry Stimson, the Secretary of War in May 1945, uh, he, explained, he explained the matter in this way. This was, a, well, in the midst of an account of why we have to break down other regional systems while preserving and extending our own. And what he said is, I think it's not asking too much to have our own little region over here, namely Latin America, which has never bothered anybody. Well, that was May 1945, uh, and that's, that essentially takes care of Latin America. The general thinking behind US policy was laid out rather lo quite lucidly uh, and, and uh, 
in, 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 in an informative way it was worth reading, and primarily in the work of George Kennan. Kennan is uh, one of the most lucid, thoughtful, and humane, and liberal, and dovish, I should say, of the American planners, so much so, in fact, he was thrown out of the State Department by about 1950, because uh, he was too soft for them. Uh, but, and now he's a noted dove, anti-war critic, uh, anti-nuclear critic, and so on and so forth. He was head of the State Department planning staff in the late 1940s, and wrote uh, the uh, major general policy statements, and they're quite interesting. So, for example, in uh, pol PPS uh, Policy Planning Study 23 in February 1948, he explained the, the rationale, the basic thinking behind U.S. policy in the following terms. He said, we have about 50% of the world's wealth, but only about 6.3% of its population. In this situation, we cannot fail to be the object of envy and resentment. Our real task in the coming period is to devise a pattern of relationships which will permit us to maintain this position of disparity. We need not deceive ourselves, but we can afford today the luxury of altruism and world benefaction. We should cease to talk about vague and unreal objectives, such as human rights, the raising of the living standards, and democratization. The day is not far off when we are going to have to deal with straight power concepts. The less we're hampered by idealistic slogans, the better. Remember, that's the view from the liberal dovish side. <laughs> well, this, of course, was a top secret internal document. Uh, for the, uh, these idealistic slogans, of course, must be trumpeted constantly in the schools and universities and scholarship and the media in order to pacify the domestic population. But here it's the planners talking to the serious people, talking to each other. Well, there are a number of questions that can be raised about this analysis of Kennan. Uh, one is about his suggestion that human rights, the raising of the living standards and democratization should be ignored, that is, should be irrelevant to a foreign policy. If we look at the record over those years, uh, a different picture suggests itself, namely that these should not be ig ignored, but rather that they should be vigorously combated. Uh, in fact, American policy over the years has, vigor has forcefully opposed uh, human rights, democratization, and the raising of the living standards for very good reasons, uh, because in fact, a commitment to Kennan's major point, namely maintaining the disparity, uh, in requires such measures. I'm gonna return to that. Uh, well, this particular document that I was just quoting actually referred to the Far East, but as I, was say, as I said before, the United States is a global power, and therefore the policies apply everywhere the same way. Kennan himself elaborated essentially the same doctrine for Latin America. This was in a meeting for Latin American ambassadors in 1950, a briefing for Latin American ambassadors, uh, and uh, this, uh, he explained to them that one main concern of American foreign policy in Latin America is what he called the protection of our raw materials. Notice our raw materials, that is no mincing of words here. Uh, and how do we, who do we have to protect them from in Latin America? Well, uh, if you look around, you'll notice that the people we have to protect them from are the Latin Americans, obviously. <laughs> uh, we have to protect them from internal aggression. Uh, and how do we protect them? That's the question. How do we protect our resources from the internal aggression of the people of Latin America? Well, here's the way Kennan explained it. And again, let me remind you, this is from the liberal, dovish, humane side of the spectrum. He said, the final answer might be an unpleasant one, but we should not hesitate before police repression by the local government. This is not shameful, since the communists are essentially traitors. It's better to have a strong regime in power than a liberal government if it is indulgent and relaxed and penetrated by communists. Well, next question, who are the communists? Uh, that's explained for example, in a State Department intelligence report uh, of about the same time, uh, which discusses what it calls the belief that is spreading throughout the world that the government has direct responsibility for the welfare of the people. And uh, the point of this report was to warn against the spread of this dangerous <laughs> and grim doctrine which might threaten our raw materials. And uh, one of the operational definitions of the term communist in American political discourse, whether official or you know, media or whatever, is uh, communist means, for example, people who, are, who have this belief that the government should uh, be concerned for the welfare of the people. That makes them communists. Uh, there are other definitions which appear in the literature which are also revealing. In 1955, 
there was a public this time, public study by a prestigious study group of the Woodrow Wilson Foundation and the National Planning Association. It was headed by William Anvil Elliott, who's a distinguished professor of government at Harvard, uh, called The Political Economy of American Foreign Policy, and very interesting reading. Uh, they explained that the primary threat of communism, I'm quoting now, the primary threat of communism, they said, is the economic transformation of the communist powers in ways which reduce their willingness and ability to complement the industrial economies of the West. Okay? And that's what makes you a communist. If you're doing something that means that you're not subordinating your economy to the needs of the West, which means, of course, the United States primarily, then you're a communist, and that's a good operational definition of it. And these two definitions pretty well coincide. Uh, people who are committed to the idea, in practice, that is, people who are committed to the idea that the government should be concerned for the welfare of the people, thereby are not committed to the idea that the governments of their countries should be committed to the welfare of us. Uh, and uh, that means they are not uh, able to, willing or able to adapt their economy so that they can complement uh, the needs of the industrial societies of the West, so therefore they're communists. Well, any country that is so evil as to undertake this course uh, is, of course, an enemy. And that, notice, that follows from the primary assumptions that our main commitment is to maintain the disparity, that is, to ensure that uh, the world is open for, to, to our exploitation, that the, what you might call the first freedom, namely the freedom to rob and exploit, that that freedom is not hampered or interfered with. As long as we're committed to that and we realize we have to use harsh measures to preserve it, uh, then you know exactly who's going to be an enemy. You can predict pretty well uh, just by looking at domestic policies. So say take Nicaragua today. It's easy to predict right off that Nicaragua is going to be an enemy uh, because it engaged, for example, in a, in a land reform program which was quite successful. It, ro it raised the health and education budgets, uh, infant mortality, fell dramatically, so much so that Nicaragua won a, an award from the World Health Organization for health achievements. Uh, and this all despite horrifying conditions left by the uh, Somoza dictatorship, which contrary to many falsehoods, the United States supported until the very end. Well, it therefore follows at once that they are enemies, that is communists, that is part of what the president called the monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that is attempting to take over the world. That was incidentally John F. Kennedy that I was quoting. Uh, uh, the, not his current clone, Ronald Reagan. Uh, the, uh, and that's true, in fact. It is part of a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy, namely a conspiracy to take away what is ours, namely our raw materials. You start raising health and education standards and lowering infant mortality and so on, and you're obviously not dedicated to the primary purpose of any government, namely uh, the transcendent needs of Big Brother. So therefore, they're enemies. Well, why do we have to destroy Nicaragua? It follows from these, uh, from these policies. It follows right off. If you want an explicit answer, you can find them all over the place, not in the press, but elsewhere. So for example, take the, this, uh, this report from Oxfam America, written by their desk officer for Latin America, Jethro Pettit. Uh, this gives a good explanation of why we have to destroy Nicaragua. It's an interview with a woman in an agricultural cooperative. She says, before the revolution, you know, Oxfam is raving radicals, as you're aware. Before the revolution, we didn't participate in anything, she says. We only learned how to make tortillas and cook beans and do what our husbands told us. In only five years, we've seen a lot of changes, and we're still working on it. Refers to this woman, Esmilda Flores, belongs to an agricultural cooperative in the mountains north of Esteli, Nicaragua. Together with seven other women and 15 men, she works land that was formerly a coffee plantation owned by an absentee landlord. After the revolution in 1979, the families who had worked the land became its owners. They've expanded production to include corn, beans, potatoes, cabbages, and dairy cows. Before we had to rent a small plot to grow any food, Flores said, and we had to pay one half of our crop to the landlord. Now we work just as hard as before, both in the fields and at home, but there's a difference because we're working for ourselves. Uh, goes on to talk about the shift of women's roles, their role in adult literacy programs, the students as teachers, the rural health programs, vaccination programs, and so on. And all of this explains was that the United States succeeded in wiping out virtually all of the buffalo. Now, this is an agricultural country, and buffalo means tractors, fertilizers, and so on. And they were essentially wiped out. Uh, India, in 1977, tried to send Vietnam 100 buffalo you know, to replenish the 
tens of thousands that we had wiped out in the course of this successful war. The United States threatened to uh, withdraw food for peace aid from India if they proceeded with that. That's another one that Orwell would have liked. In Laos, uh, where the United States wiped out the agricultural system in one of the poorest peasant societies in the world by what at that time was the most intensive bombing in history, later exceeded in Cambodia, uh, there was naturally starvation after the war. Uh, so the Carter administration, which, has, which was uh, giving sermons about uh, how human rights is the soul of our foreign policy, uh, was asked to give rice. We have the largest rice reserves in the world, and we had, we had relations with Laos. We have diplomatic relations with them. And every other country that had diplomatic relations with them was, in fact, trying to give them some uh, aid to uh, uh, overcome the crisis. Well, the Carter administration refused. Uh, there was a little fuss about that. That seemed a little too much. Uh, to refuse to offer rice from our huge rice reserves to a country that we had worried where there's starvation because we'd wiped out the agricultural system. So with great fanfare, uh, the Carter administration announced that it was in fact giving rice to uh, uh, Laos, which showed that human rights was the soul of our foreign policy, uh, and it in fact then allowed a little trickle of rice, a few thousand, uh, a few tons to go in. But it uh, later turned out that that rice had been deducted from a uh, contribution to the United Nations that was going to go to Laos anyway through another channel, so the net result was zero. Uh, this reveals the you know, hypocrisy and sadism of the American administrations in quite a sharp form, I think. Actually, Carter explained all of this in one of, one of his sermons on human rights. He was asked, uh, what about Vietnam? Doesn't that show that something about human rights? And he said the following. He said that we owe Vietnam no debt because he explained, I'm quoting now, he said the destruction was mutual. You sort of take a walk through San Francisco and New York, and you can easily see that. What's interesting is not that he said it, but that it evoked no response. There was no comment in the press, not a word in the press anywhere, uh, with regard to this statement, which, is, which belongs in the category of, of Stalin and Hitler, certainly. But we owe them no debt because the destruction is mutual. So we continue to proceed with the policy that, uh, for, that, uh, that say, the Far Eastern Economic Review, another radical source, calls the policy of bleeding Vietnam. One Another part of this, incidentally, is our support for, for the, uh, in effect, our support for Pol Pot. Uh, uh, we do it in various devious ways, but the State Department has explained it. Uh, they say we support the current Democratic Kampuchea coalition because of its continuity. That's the State Department phrase, because of its continuity with the Pol Pot regime. So therefore, we support it through China. Uh, but that's uh, part of the policy of, of bleeding Vietnam. Well, that's the post-war period, uh, and that is a way of ensuring that the victory stays. There's another aspect to this. Uh, while we were demolishing Indochina and thus getting rid of that rotten apple, potential rotten apple, we were also making sure that the other apples didn't get infected. And we were doing this effectively, and it worked. So for example, in 1965, uh, there was a military coup in Indonesia supported by the United States, maybe even organized by the United States, but certainly supported by it, uh, which led to the immediate massacre within the next several months of several hundred thousand people, maybe seven or eight hundred thousand people, mostly landless peasants, uh, which demolished the mass-based, the only mass-based political party in Indonesia. Uh, and that was, uh, and it also turned Indonesia into a uh, paradise for investors. The right to rob was granted without any restrictions. Uh, this was greeted with great glee in the United States, in particular by American liberals, uh, who talked about the dramatic changes that had been taken place in Indonesia in the Freedom House Statement, for example, the most dramatic being the massacre within four or five months of three quarters of a million people. Uh, and the way in which this was presented was the following. The, all of these marvelous developments had taken place behind the shield of American intervention in South Vietnam. That is, that provided the basis on which we could ensure uh, that our positions of strength would be uh, built up in the surrounding regions so that any potential rot wouldn't, threat, wouldn't spread. And that went on elsewhere throughout the region too. So for example, in 1972, uh, when there was a danger of uh, national capitalism developing in the Philippines, uh, that is, the Supreme Court was considering uh, laws restricting uh, repatriation of profits and other threats to the transcendent need, namely to maintain the disparity, the United States moved in to back a military coup 
uh, uh, a military dictatorship. In fact, it installed, in effect, a military dictatorship of the Latin American type, high technology, torture, and so on, uh, the kind that we impose in Latin America whenever a problem arises. That was done in the Philippines in 72, and that was, again, was part of strengthening the surrounding region. So there's a dual process. One, extirpate the rot at the source, make sure there's no successful development inside Vietnam, particularly South Vietnam, which is the most dangerous part, uh, and strengthen the uh, uh, barriers around, around the outside. And that was all a considerable success. Uh, so it's mis misleading to call this, uh, to call this a, uh, a defeat for the United States. Uh, it wasn't. Let's turn back to Kennan's three criteria, three important uh, considerations, democratization, raising of the living standards, and human rights. Uh, what about human rights and raising the living standards in Indochina? Well, it would be obscene to discuss that. Uh, let's talk about the question of democratization. There, the American role was interesting. In 1954, we blocked elections, because they were going to come out the wrong way. In the early 1960s, we blocked elections, for the reason I mentioned. Uh, we had a minnow on the other side had a whale, so obviously you can't have elections. Uh, in Laos, uh, in 1958, there were much to our, uh, over, over uh, the United States worked very hard to prevent elections in Laos. In fact, it poured tons of money in to buy the election and so on. Nevertheless, the elections took place and in, 1958, in 1958, but the wrong guys won. The Pathet Lao and the, that's the guerrillas and the left-leaning neutralists won. So the United States, within several months, had overturned that government and installed a, a, a rightist government, but that wasn't enough. We had to overthrow that and put in a government so extreme, so far right, so extreme, that even the mainstream moderates turned against it, setting off a civil war that took care of Laos. That's our commitment to democracy. That's the that's a, a illustration of our commitment to democracy in that region. And so the question sometimes comes up, why the United States should be so concerned about the internal any any development in a country like say Laos. I mean Laos is you know the least significant country in the world. You know most of the people in Laos didn't even know there was such a thing as Laos. They knew there was a village. Uh, the first thing they learned about the outside world was when these strange jets came over and started bombing them. So they had to run into the hills and uh, live in caves for two years and so on. Uh, why do we care? You know the, the United States conceded. Uh, the administration conceded that the bombing of northern Laos had no relation to the Vietnam War to military operations there. In fact, it was aimed at destroying and wiping out a rather mild social revolution that was beginning in Laos. So why this kind of fanatic intensity to destroy any potential positive development in a country so insignificant where you have no interest whatsoever? Or Grenada, you know? Why, uh, why as soon as the Bishop government came in, did we immediately have to set out to destabilize and undermine uh, a government concerned with the welfare of the people in this little speck in the Caribbean that you could barely find on a map. Well, uh, I think you can understand that if you consider the general thinking, the general geopolitical conception again. The problem is that the rot can spread. Uh, and if even a tiny, nothing country like Laos or Grenada, with its minimal, non-existent resources, if it can begin to do something for the welfare of its own population, that's even more dangerous than if a stronger country does it. Because then, if even they can do it, you know, then why can't we? That's the obvious question. So therefore, you find this really quite fanatic intensity and ferocity uh, directed against the tiniest, most marginal places that might begin to escape the escape total control. You find that quite consistently over the years. Well, let me turn to Central America. This is a much longer story, and I'll only be able to touch it. Uh, major, this uh, major U.S. military intervention in Central America began in 1854. Uh, that was, in that year, the United States Navy uh, bombarded and destroyed a port town in Nicaragua, San Juan del Norte. This town was incidentally uh, captured for a couple of days by Contras about a year ago, and the press was all there, you know, making big stories about it. They missed the main story, which is that this town has a history, namely it was burned down by the U.S. Navy 130 years before. Now, that was not a capricious action. The U.S. Navy was avenging a, uh, an insult. Uh, what had happened was that uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, an American millionaire, had sailed his yacht in there, and uh, port authorities had tried to levy port charges against him. So in revenge, the Navy burned down the town. <laughs> well, in the first third of this century, uh, US, the United States sent military forces to Cuba, Panama, Mexico, Honduras, 
It occupied Haiti for 20 years, uh, where it succeeded in uh, reinstating slavery and uh, destroying villages and torturing and killing plenty of people. And uh, it left a legacy which still remains today in one of the most miserable corners of one of the most miserable areas of the world. In particular, it installed a long-lasting and brutal dictatorship uh, under, the, under Woodrow Wilson. Uh, the great apostle of self-determination, you remember, he celebrated this doctrine by attacking Mexico, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. Uh, in uh, uh, he, uh, his counterinsurgency operations in the Dominican Republic also, uh, this is a long major war which went on for about six years, uh, also with plenty of destruction and torture, and it also established a long-lasting military dictatorship, the Trujillo dictatorship, the United States invaded Nicaragua repeatedly during this period, again leaving behind, finally, uh, another long-lasting and brutal dictatorship, the Somoza dictatorship. In the post-World War II period, there have been repeated interventions. Uh, in Guatemala in 1954, there occurred what John Foster Dulles called, Secretary of State, a new and glorious chapter in the already glorious traditions of the American states. Namely, the United States intervened to overthrow a capitalist democracy uh, with New Deal-style policies, uh, hence evidencing some concern for the welfare of the people, so therefore, by definition, communists. Uh, they were overthrown. That was Guatemala's first attempt at democracy. And uh, we installed their uh, country, a government, which is probably the closest parallel to Nazi Germany in the contemporary world over a long period. And we've kept it that way, a real hell on earth. Uh, we've kept it that way with periodic intervention. So in 1963, it looked as though there was a danger of another election taking place. So Kennedy supported a military coup. In the all of this evoked resistance, as it usually does. In the late 1960s, the United States, States sent its own military forces uh, into Guatemala, the Green Berets bombing from Panamanian sanctuaries. Uh, maybe eight or 10,000 people were killed. That quieted things for a little while. In the late 1970s, uh, the disruption began again, you know, resistance began again. At that time, there was a bit of a problem. Uh, there was this thing called the human rights policy, which is mistakenly associated with the American presidency. In fact, every president has fought bitterly against it. But part of the effect of Vietnam, the Vietnam War, was to change the consciousness of the country. And Congress, to a limited extent, reflects popular attitudes. Uh, and in fact, Congress initiated congressional legislation uh, blocking the sending of military aid to the most brutal and, vi and vicious tyrants, and that's always impeded the executive, including Carter, though they've always found around ways around it, including Carter, uh, and it was impossible to directly send military aid to Guatemala. So it was sent in other ways. It's commonly believed and often stated here that in 1977, American military aid to Guatemala stopped. That's false. If you look at the Pentagon printouts, you discover that military aid continued at approximately the normal level slightly below it, it just went in more devious fashions. Uh, and we brought in our proxies. Uh, fortunately, uh, Argentina had just had a Nazi-type revolution, so we had Argentine neo-Nazis who we could bring in. Uh, they're the ones we used for training the Guatemalans. Also, uh, they're the first trainers we used for the Contras in Nicaragua. And we then brought Israel in, which uh, took over the main job of training and arming the Guatemalans. And the government then carried out another major attack on the population. This is the worst yet. This is real. Even the church, the, conser the church, which in Guatemala is very conservative, uh, referred to this one as, as genocide. Uh, nobody knows how many people were killed, but uh, it's now estimated that from this period alone, uh, there are about 100,000 children in Guatemala who have lost one or another parent. So that gives you some estimate of it. Well, that's uh, Guatemala, the glorious chapter in the already glorious traditions of the American states. Uh, that was... Uh, uh, also, in addition to this, there was uh, intervention in Cuba, in the Dominican Republic, uh, in El Salvador, in Grenada, and a 20-year war of terrorism against Cuba, and now a war against Nicaragua. Well, that's the record, you know, very briefly for the last 100 years or so. The impact of that has been horrendous. There's vast starvation through the region, while croplands are devoted to export to the United States. GNP tends to go up, but nutritional levels tend to go down. Uh, for the, uh, as part of the attempt to maintain the disparity. That's happening throughout the region. Uh, there's slavery, uh, crushing poverty, torture, massacre. Uh, every country that we've managed to 
uh, get into our bloody hands. In El Salvador alone, about 30,000 people were killed from October 79, an important date to which I'll return, from October 1979 through 1981, about 30,000 people were killed and uh, about uh, 600,000 refugees were generated. These figures have approximately doubled since. That's overwhelmingly the responsibility of, uh, of uh, US uh, sponsored uh, military forces called death squads. The efficiency of the killing has escalated recently because the United States is now participating directly. Uh, that is, American planes, American military units operating from Panamanian and Honduran sanctuaries are now coordinating bombing strikes, which is increasing the kill rate against uh, defenseless villages and fleeing peasants, so that's an improvement. Uh, Reagan's war against Nicaragua has added maybe another thousand, eight thousand or so casualties. That's in addition to the 50,000 or so left by the Somoza War, supported by the United States till the end. Uh, since we overthrew democracy in Guatemala in, eight, in 1954, about 150,000 people have been killed outright by U.S.-backed death squads, often with direct U.S. military participation. I mentioned the, uh, uh, the recent figures for the last couple of years. These numbers sound kind of cold. It becomes different if you look at the actual stories. You know, a lot of documentation on this from Human Rights Group, Amnesty International, Survival International, and others. You look through that, uh, and, you know, if you can stand it, uh, you get a picture of what's actually going on. So, for example, you read how uh, in one village, uh, Guatemalan forces came in, uh, sent all the population into a, a town building, took the men out uh, and beheaded them, uh, raped and then killed all the women, took the children down to the river and smashed their heads against rocks and killed them. Two or three people escaped and they told the story. That's typical. That's what we're buying with our Argentine and uh, uh, Israeli surrogates there or doing it ourselves elsewhere. Virtually every attempt to bring about any improvement, any constructive change in this U U.S. installed chamber of horrors has been met with a new dose of U.S. violence. The whole record is one of the most sh shameful chapters of modern history and naturally is little known here, though in a free country this is the kind of thing you'd be taught in elementary school in all of its sordid detail. Throughout, the, whole, the pose has always been that we're defending ourselves. We're defending ourselves against internal aggression. So today, when our mercenary army attacks Nicaragua, uh, we're defending ourselves against the Bolshevik proxy. Nicaragua is a Bolshevik proxy, threatening Mexico, ultimately us. Nothing new about that. In 1926, when Calvin Coolidge sent the Marines to invade Nicaragua, uh, we were defending ourselves against the Russians. That time, the cast of characters was a little different. Then Mexico was a Bolshevik proxy threatening Nicaragua, so we had to go in and invade Nicaragua. In fact, Coolidge said Mexico is on trial, bef uh, uh, he said Mexico is on trial before the world. That was Coolidge's statement when he sent the Marines to Nicaragua to, prevent, to protect us against Bolshevism. You'll notice that though the cast of characters changes, the bottom line stays the same, namely kill lots of Nicaraguans. We've been torturing them for many years. Uh, what did we do before we had Bolsheviks to defend ourselves against? So when uh, Woodrow Wilson sent his warriors to uh, Haiti and the Dominican Republic, there weren't any Bolsheviks. So what were, who were we defending ourselves then? Well, we were defending ourselves then against the Huns, it turned out. Uh, you go back to uh, uh, the Marine commander, Thorpe, explained to his troops that they were fighting, that he said that we were fighting against the Huns in, in the Dominican Republic, just as the way other Marines are fighting uh, at Haiti, just the way other Marines are fighting the Huns in Germany. And he actually had a proof that the Huns were involved in uh, Haiti in particular. Uh, the problem was that the niggers, as he called them, were putting up such a stiff resistance that there must be a German hand, he explained that. Uh, so that proved that, and that's about as good a proof as we usually use. Uh, in the Dominican Republic, we weren't killing niggers. There we were killing those who Theodore Roosevelt called Dam Dagos, or Spicks, uh, and uh, we've been killing them for, in one or another place, uh, 200,000 of the Philippines, also niggers if you look back uh, a couple of years earlier and so on. Well, that was, then we had to defend ourselves against the Huns. In the 19th century, uh, when we were finishing off the native population, that was no small matter, incidentally. Current estimates are that the Native American population was in the order of 12 to 15 million north of the Rio Grande when uh, uh, 
Columbus discovered America, as we put it, uh, by the time the United States had reached the limits of its continental expansion and the turn of the century, there were about 200,000 of them. Uh, in fact, uh, in Hispaniola, the you know, Dominican Republic in Haiti, about 8 million were killed in 25 years, even worse, south of the border. There, a population of about 80 million was reduced by about 95 percent within a 100 or 150 years. This is one of the great exercises of mass genocide in human history, which we celebrate every October when we uh, honor Columbus, who was a great mass murderer himself on Columbus Day. But our own contribution was not inestimable. And at that time, if you look back, we were also defending ourselves. Then we were defending ourselves against the British and the Spanish. The Indians were attacking us from their Spanish and uh, from Florida and, and Canada, uh, their sanctuaries. So we had to take Florida and take most of the West uh, uh, it's in self-defense against this internal aggression supported by these dangerous enemies. Uh, in 1846, the United States had to defend itself against Mexico. Uh, there was aggression by Mexico, which began deep inside Mexican territory. Uh, and in the course of that defense against internal aggression, we stole about a third of Mexico. We had to take California because the British might have taken it otherwise, so we had to defend ourselves against them. And so it goes way back. Uh, the uh, point is that the evil empire changes, but the truth of the matter stays about the same. Well, let me turn finally to uh, Kennan's formula again. Uh, about human rights, raising the living standards, and democratization. Now let's consider Latin America and ask whether the, these considerations are really irrelevant, as he suggested, or something else. Well, that can be studied, and in fact has been studied. So let's take human rights first. Uh, there have been studies of the relation between human rights in Latin America and American foreign policy. One of them was carried out by the leading academic specialist on this topic, Lars Schultz, author of the major works on human rights in Latin America. Uh, he did a study which appears in Comparative Politics, January 1981, and he found out that there is, in fact, a relationship between American policy and human rights. Uh, the relationship, as he puts it, is as follows. U.S. aid flows to governments that torture their citizens to the hemisphere's relatively egregious violators of fundamental human rights. That is, the more a government tortures its citizens, the more we aid it. So there's a correlation. Furthermore, the correlation is strong. It includes military aid, uh, it runs right through the Carter period, and just to control, to show that it's not a secondary effect of concern for need, it turns out that aid is not correlated with need. In fact, what it's correlated with is torture. That's the primary thing it's correlated with. So there's a relationship. Well, a correlation isn't a theory. You know, correlation still asks for an explanation. Uh, and there are a couple of possible explanations one might give. One that comes to mind right off is that the United States government just likes torture. So therefore, it aids governments that torture their citizens. But that's implausible. It's more likely that Kennan is right, that torture is just an irrelevance. Uh, uh, there's a better explanation. It comes from another study done by Edward Herman, a, an economist at the University of Pennsylvania, who's a co-author with me of some books. Uh, he did a study in which he also investigated the relationship between US aid and torture and so on not restricted to Latin America, and he found the same correlation. In fact, every study finds it. But he did a second study, which explains it, I think. Uh, he did a study which correlated uh, American aid with uh, changes in the investment climate, so as measured, say, by laws that repatriate profits and that sort of thing. And he found out, as you'd expect, that American aid correlates very closely with it. That is, the more a government improves the climate for business operations, the more we aid them. OK, well, that explains everything. Uh, that correlation follows directly from the fundamental geopolitical conception. That is, the more a government is devoted to the right to rob, obviously the more we support it, because it's helping maintain the disparity and helping ensure that their resources are our resources and so on. Uh, so that correlation is obvious, it follows from the well-documented geopolitical conception which plays itself out all over the world. Well, what does this have to do with torture? Well, everything because the way to improve the climate for business operations is, after all, what? It's to torture priests, murder peasant organizers, destroy political parties, and so on. That is naturally the way to improve the climate for business operations. That's the way to ensure that nobody gets any funny ideas in their head about governments being concerned for the welfare of the population. Uh, so that happens. There's a secondary correlation between, uh, between the investment climate and torture, and that yields the w a strong correlation between American aid and uh, human rights violations, egregious violations of human rights. 
Well, that's human rights. What about raising the living standards? Here, the matter is slightly more complex. In most of the countries where the United States has intervened, there is economic growth, and it typically has a dual character. The export sector, usually linked to American-based multinationals, grows. So crops are produced for export. Uh, little elites that are the subsidiaries of American multinationals are rich, often super rich. Uh, uh, but most of the for most of the population, the living standards actually decline. Uh, that's happened over and over again. Increasing starvation, for example, correlates quite well with increasing agricultural production of cotton and coffee and so on and so forth. Uh, the results of this are quite astounding. They're worth looking at closely. So take Brazil. Uh, Brazil was, is one of the big dominoes. Uh, that was, we in managed to back and help install a uh, military dictatorship there in 1964. Kennedy laid the basis for it. Johnson actually implemented it. Uh, this was the first of the really major national security states, Nazi-style states that the United States imposed their back throughout most of the region in the last 20 years, beginning with the Kennedy administration. Uh, and it's a big one. You know, Brazil is the most important state in Latin America, so what happened there affected lots of other things. There was a domino effect. Uh, the country was essentially taken over by American corporations, as usually happens, and there was an economic miracle. Uh, this, incidentally, was described by Kennedy's ambassador, Lincoln Gordon, as the greatest victory for freedom in the mid-20th century, the installation of a terrorist regime in uh, Brazil. Uh, and there was economic growth, and you can look at the results of it now. So, for example, a recent issue of a Brazilian scientific journal studies nutritional standards in Rio de Janeiro, which is not one of the poorer areas. It's not the Northeast, you know, it's a relatively wealthy area. And it gives figures for severe malnutrition for children. Here's the figures. Uh, from zero to five months, severe malnutrition is 67%. Uh, for from five months to a year, uh, the uh, severe malnutrition is 40%. And from a year to five years, it's 10%. Uh, why do the figures go down? Well, because they die. You know? uh, so the figures go down for severe malnutrition. Well, that's one of the better areas uh, where this economic miracle has taken place. And this story is duplicated pretty much throughout Latin America with some variations here and there in Haiti and the Dominican Republic and Nicaragua and Guatemala and so on. So that's raising the living standards. What about democratization? Well, Guatemala I've already mentioned, Chile you know. Take the Dominican Republic. That's an interesting and slightly more subtle case. Uh, the United States did intervene uh, and fought a major war in the Dominican Republic installing the Trujillo dictatorship in the 1920s. That lasted till around 1960. Then there was a move towards democratization. In fact, there was a democratic election. Juan Bosch was elected uh, in, uh, in, in 1962. Uh, it was clear that there was very likely to be a military coup. The military forces were there, and they were going to overthrow that government if they had a chance. Juan Bosch and, and the Dominican democracy had one chance to survive, namely if Bosch was able to organize some sort of popular support. And he tried. He tried to institute land reform to uh, allow labor unions to organize and so on, and he was blocked by the Kennedy administration. Kennedy's ambassador blocked it. You have to understand, this is Latin America. This country's run by the American embassy, basically. And they blocked it. And that meant that when the uh, inevitable military dictatorship coup came along, there was no very little popular support, and Guatemala and Dominican democracy collapsed. Well, uh, uh, in 1965, there was again a threat of democracy. There was a reformist coup, and it looked as if a constitutionalist group might move in again with Bosch. Uh, so the United States just invaded outright. Uh, we sent the Marines in that time in the traditional fashion. That was 65. Uh, and we uh, installed the usual terror and torture state of the Latin American type that we like. The country was taken over by Gulf and Western and other corporations. <laughs> then, when the society was totally demoralized uh, and cowed by terror and suffering, uh, we allowed elections, certain that nothing could be done by any government for the population at that point, uh, and uh, that is that part of the population that remained. Throughout the Caribbean, about 20% of the population has fled to the United States, and in Puerto Rico, where there was another economic miracle, it's about 40%. Well, let me turn finally to El Salvador. Uh, getting kind of late, but if you don't mind, I'll go on for a couple minutes. Uh, El Salvador is constructed, we have seen another scene today. In 1972, uh, there was an election in El Salvador. It was immediately overthrown by the military. The United States backed the overthrow. 
Why they would let the king of the United States, nobody wouldn't talk to him, the liberal senators wouldn't talk to him. Basically, nobody cared. Same thing happened in 1977, nobody cared. Meanwhile, the dictatorship, the military dictatorship, the mayor dictatorship was the usual Latin American type that we like, lots of torture and so on and so forth. Not a whisper of concern in the United States. Everything is normal. Uh, however, there were two problems developing. Uh, one, in fact, came to a head in 1979 when Somalia was overthrown. Uh, that was one. But the second was in El Salvador itself. There were dangerous developments going on. There was the beginning of the growth of what were called popular organizations, mainly in the church initiated, uh, self help groups, cooperatives, uh, peasant associations, unions, and so on. They were spreading all over the place. And the problem is that this begins to lay the basis for a functioning democracy. Anybody who thinks for a minute realizes that democracy can't work if each isolated individual faces a concentrated system of power alone. If that's what happens, democracy is just a matter of pushing a button every couple of years, trying to decide which of several clones will make the decisions for you. Uh, for democracy to work, and this has always been understood, there have to be ways in which people can become associated, freely associated, in which weak, isolated people can join, you know, to get information, let's say, to form opinions, to, to, to make plans, and to put forward plans in the political arena. If that can happen, you can have democracy. And the problem was, in the 1970s, all that was beginning to happen in El Salvador. So going back to the basic principles, you could predict what was going to happen, and it did. In October 1979, the, uh, the United States Carter was well, back to a military, a reformist military coup, which overthrew the Romero dictatorship, which they were afraid was going to go to the Somoza, who had just fallen. The United States insisted that the most right-wing elements of the military be dominant there. Uh, killings rapidly increased. They've been bad enough under Romero, but they, kept, they increased very fast, after, uh, immediately. By early 1980, the reformist military elements had been thrown out. Uh, left Christian Democrats had been eliminated, socialists had been eliminated, and everything was safely back into the hands of the usual thugs and murderers who we installed throughout Latin America. Uh, this time with what they introduced as a, as a cover for it. The Archbishop, Archbishop Romero, who had been very conservative, incidentally, which is why I was appointed, but got concerned when priests began to be killed and that sort of thing. Uh, he pleaded with Carter not to send military aid. And his wording was interesting. He said that military aid would increase massacre and repression and it would destroy the popular organizations. So, of course, that was the very essence of American policy, to increase massacre and repression and to destroy the popular organizations. So naturally, Carter sent aid and it had exactly that effect. Romero was assassinated shortly after the meeting of the meeting. Carter's war against the peasantry began. This was under the guise of land reform. Land reform is useful because it tends to bring up into the open peasant organizers, so it's easier to kill them all. Uh, and in fact, the areas where worst repression was the area where land reform was going on. Uh, the war began on a large scale with a major massacre in the Simple River in May 1980, the pincerous movement between the Honduran and Salvadoran army, almost surely with American coordination, they got 600 people killed. That one was suppressed by the American press for about 15 months, so it was immediately reported by church sources and foreign press. Well, that was the war against the peasantry, which took off uh, with full steam at that time. In June, the university was attacked by the army. Uh, the rector was killed, a lot of faculty and students were killed, the libraries were burned, it was sacked, in fact, closed down. In November, the political opposition was massacred. Uh, meanwhile, the independent media were destroyed, uh, blown up, uh, you know, editors of newspapers taken away and found in ditches with their decapitated after hideous torture and so on. We don't approve of censorship in the United States, and we're very irate when the Nicaraguans censor a journal which is supporting a military attack against them. We would never do that, say, if we were under attack by some superpower and some newspaper were supporting the superpower that's attacking us. In fact, we wouldn't, because the people would long ago have been in concentration camps or killed or something like that. Uh, but we are quite upset when the Nicaraguans do that. What we prefer, and in El Salvador, where we're operating, there isn't a reason of censorship. That's totally true. The reason is that every independent organ and the have long ago been wiped out. You know, they're bombed or destroyed or the editor's torture or something, so there's no censorship. That's good. Uh, well, uh, this was a success. The popular organizations were indeed destroyed, uh, as intended. So therefore, we can allow democracy. We can have an election. 
contact between the American and the Greek CIA, when the Greek CIA is a subsidiary, we got that government until 1974. Uh, and then in 1974, there was a uh, democratic coup, so they at least took it away from it uh, and took it towards Turkey, which it was then in conflict. We supported Greece as long as it's fascist, and then supported Turkey immediately in the conflict, which is not over Cyprus, as soon as the coup took place. And things have now evolved, and now uh, Papandreou is the uh, prime minister. Well, what can happen now? But uh, Greece can do very little. Greece has been, for one thing, uh, the, any real hope of an independent economy was long because they were shattered. Uh, and Greece, Greece has virtually no productive economy. Uh, they, they, all of the workers who went off and slaved away in Germany, the money that they sent back, which was a lot, was not productively invested. It was invested in housing and that sort of thing. And uh, what there was of productive economy was largely brought up by American corporations. Furthermore, any chance that Greece might the United States has a weapon against Greece, which can protect it and prevent it from doing anything, and that is Turkey. Uh, one of the reasons the United States supports a military dictatorship, which is called a democracy in Turkey, uh, and, uh, uh, and we keep the arm it heavily. And if, uh, if Greece cannot, could not survive against its primary enemy, namely Turkey, if we withdrew support for Greece and back Turkey, that's in fact what happened over Cyprus. Uh, the United States in the early 60s had uh, planned to dismember Cyprus. There was something called the Atchison Plan, which was the Atchison. Uh, and the intent was to partition Cyprus between uh, a Greek and a Turkish part. The main purpose, the only concern of the United States for Cyprus is that it's a part of the military base system surrounding the Middle East. That's it's got to be an unthinkable aircraft carrier, as they say. And they thought this would be more secure with part of it under Greek rule and part of it under Turkish rule, Greece and Turkey being controllable. Uh, and uh, that, for all complicated reasons I won't go into, this came to a head in 1974 when the United States got its partition when, when Turkey invaded at the current break as approximately the Axis and Line partition lines. Uh, and uh, in fact, we, as I said, as soon as the democratic coup took place, we, we, we overthrew the military dictatorship took place in Greece, Kissinger immediately took it towards Turkey and back the uh, Turkish occupation. We've been keeping that position since. Now, that's a weapon that can be used anywhere against Greece, against the Aegean Islands, against Greece itself, and that means that Greece's freedom of maneuver is extremely limited. Now, this is a mild, reformist, social democratic government and it can do something, but it can't really get out of line, as far as I can see. Peace Corps? Well, uh, I think the Peace Corps has been very valuable, primarily in that it's given many Americans uh, uh, a, a learning experience. That is, a lot of, I don't know if they've done anything much for the country that they've been in. You know, some have, but just, I don't think it's been a noticeable impact. But it's been a noticeable impact on Americans who have simply learned something about the world, you know, the real world, the world that's sitting in there as a group most of the time. Now, you don't mean that here, but many people have learned it over there, and I think that's been valuable. Also, just incidentally, I think these people have done useful things, digging wells and sort of thing. The United States essentially has had no, I doesn't care much about Lebanon. In fact, what we care about in the Middle East is primarily oil. And in fact, this is a long story in itself, but the American relationship with Israel, which is off the chart, just in scale, you know, if you just look at aid or anything else, it's not comparable to any other country. That's primarily a reflection of uh, a specific American conception of Israel. Namely, uh, the United States has crafted its policies so that Israel will become a highly militarized state with no independent economy, uh, totally dependent on the United States, hence dependable, uh, technologically advanced, you know, militarily competent, uh, kind of spider, which we can use for our purposes. Uh, and that's essentially happened, and what's kind of striking is that people who call themselves supporters of Israel support these policies, so that's another story. Lebanon is only of interest to the United States, again, as part of the uh, you know, as part of the concern for the rest of the, for the, the real interest in the region, namely the oil producing these areas. 